a short prayer today saying, thank you, divine universe, amazing mystery of life. Thank you for those people that have joined the fellowship today. May we love and support them. May they find that this is a welcoming home for their spiritual growth, for their questions, and for their talents. Blessed be and amen. So my husband and I went to see the movie Hidden Figures this week. I really recommend it if you haven't seen it yet. It is about the prejudice that happened in the early 1960s in the space program here in Houston, Texas, actually. It's a story of three African-American women. Each of them were brilliant mathematicians, and they were hired by NASA to be human calculators. In fact, they were called the human computers. Well, if I told you the truth, they were called the colored computers. Dorothy Vaughn was one of those. And when she got wind that something called IBM was coming to NASA, she went to the library and looked it up to find out what exactly is going on here. Then she got a book on Fortran, and she taught herself and all of the women in her department programming. So she became the first African-American manager at NASA because she was the only one that could figure out how to make that thing work. And conveniently, she just happened to have 30 well-trained African-American programmers at her ready. She saved their jobs. Mary Jackson was one of the human computers as well. She became NASA's first African-American female aeronautical space engineer. This was only possible after she went to court and battled to be allowed to take courses at an all-white school. She needed nine courses that were offered nowhere in the black universities, and she talked to judge into letting her take courses at an all-white school. And then there was Katherine Johnson. She was a mathematical genius. She was promoted to the flight station at NASA, where she, she participated in calculating trajectories for all of the missions, launch windows, when to launch and when to come back into the atmosphere. And she also calculated emergency backup return paths for all of the flights. She worked at NASA early on in Project Mercury, which was the project to actually put man into space. She was involved with uh, the John Glenn mission and also Alan Shepard mission. Later, she was in the Apollo missions, calculating trajectories for Apollo 11, our first landing on the moon. She also worked on the space shuttle missions. And finally, she worked on the mission to Mars. So the movie, Hidden Figures, is mostly about Katherine Johnson in her early years at NASA. The most striking thing that stood out to me about her story was that when she was promoted to the flight station, it was on the eastern campus. She was in the eastern building on the eastern campus where there was no bathroom for colored folks. So when she needed to go to the bathroom, she had to run as fast as she could to the western campus and the western building that had bathrooms for colored folks. Now, sometimes it was blistering hot. I mean, it is Houston. Sometimes it was pouring rain, and she would have to run through the pouring rain to get to the bathroom. Can you imagine that? I mean, this is the person that calculated the math to put John Glenn into orbit. John Glenn, in fact, this is a true story, and it says it in the movie, but it's also true. John Glenn would not get in the capsule unless she had looked at the numbers and okayed them. 
He said to the flight director, has the girl looked at the numbers? Because as soon as the girl says the numbers are okay, then I will get in that capsule, but not beforehand. And she had no bathroom in the building where she worked. She also had no coffee pot access. Nobody wanted her to touch the coffee pot because they didn't want to touch it after her hands had touched it. So somebody brought in another coffee pot just for her and marked it colored. That was 1960, 1961 in our city, Houston, in America. Water fountains were separate, hotels were, schools were. Black people were not welcome to eat in restaurants where white people dined. They were not welcome to sit at the front of the bus where white people sat. It's crazy, isn't it? That was our country. And I know some of you remember that. I remember that. It was in my lifetime. It's hard to imagine. But then came along Martin Luther King Jr. Hallelujah. He came with some sanity. He wanted to change the craziness of the country that says Katherine Johnson can make it safe for John Glenn to orbit the earth, but she cannot use our bathrooms. Dr. King stood out and stood tall and stood strong and was consistent in his method. His method was this, nonviolent resistance. Two very important parts, nonviolent and resistance. They're Unitarian Universalist concept, I have to say. Anyway, I want to read a part of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech to you as I do every year at this time, because I think it is so important, and we cannot forget it. So here it is. I say to you today, my friends, let us not wallow in the valley of despair. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. And so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even in the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with hate and injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day, right there in Alabama, that little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. Well, if Dr. King were here today, I would tell him we have made progress. That Katherine Johnson, at the age of 97, received the Medal of Freedom in 2015 from a black president, from Barack Obama. And that NASA named a building after her. In fact, Dr. King, the current administrator at NASA is a black man, Charlie Bowden. He's over the whole daggone space program. Dr. King, he's a black man. And there are no more whites-only bathrooms there. 
or anywhere in the United States. Blacks and whites sit next to each other on the buses now and on airplanes. They eat in the same restaurants and they sleep in the same hotels. We've come a long way. But I have to tell you, we have miles and miles and miles still to go. Because you see, Dr. King, I cannot say that the hatred and the prejudice against people with brown-colored skin is eradicated, because it's not. I surely wish that I could say that. I surely wish that I could say that to Dr. King. Unfortunately, there is still vicious hatred going on with people with different colored skins. But I would also tell Dr. King, that's not the half of it. This world that we're in has gone insane. Not only is there prejudice against the skin color that we have, but there's prejudice and hatred against what sexual orientation somebody has. There's hatred just because we have different political agendas, political uh, affiliations. There's hatred because you feel one way about abortion and I feel another. There's hatred because I feel one way about global warming and you feel another. There's hatred because of a person's gender, male, female, trans. There is no room in our country yet for trans, and yet there are trans people alive and well in the United States and in the world. There's hatred because of people's differences in religion. Oh, Dr. King, there is a lot of hatred. These two are crazy times. What can we do? Where is the sanity? Well, there is some good news. I would say, Dr. King, I have found a place where there is sanity. I have found a place where there is hope. I have found a place that's a microcosm of how we can have world peace. And it's called the Unitarian Universalist Church. The, all the fellowships and all the churches in the world that are Unitarian Universalist are the hope. Because we can have a Christian sitting next to a Muslim, sitting next to a Jew, sitting next to an atheist, And yet we can all worship together, all of us, in harmony. There's room here for all different kinds of beliefs. You don't have to believe what I believe to be here, to be loved and cared for and part of this community. You can come with your questions, your doubts, your searching, and your discussions. You can come with all of that here. There's room for you here. There's room for everyone, even the lost and the broken. Because we here stand on the side of love. Now there are lots of churches that have the principle of standing on the side of love for sure. But they only do it inside their walls. And they haven't been able to translate it yet into the rest of the world. So you see, I have a dream too, Dr. King. It includes your dream, but it doesn't stop with black and white. It doesn't stop with gay or straight. It doesn't stop with Christian or Muslim or Jew or atheist. It doesn't stop with male or female or trans. No, my dream only stops where the values and the principles of Unitarian Universalism are practice everywhere, in every situation, with every human being. In every interaction. My dream stops only when every human being is treated with dignity and respect. My dream goes to the edges until every person on the planet feels valued and feels loved. My dream, Dr. King, includes shouting on the mountaintops. There is a place. There is a faith that offers hope 
for every single person. And it doesn't have anything to do with believing in God or not believing in God. It has to do with standing on the side of love. And that's what we stand for. I have a dream, Dr. King, that someday everybody will have heard of Unitarian Universalism and be living the values and the principles that we stand for here and we really can get to peace on earth. That's my dream. I have to ask you, is it yours? Is it your goal Your dream for the world to live your faith inside the walls and outside of the walls of this fellowship hall? Is it your goal to tell people that we exist? To invite people to say, hey, I've got some good news I want to share with you. I will tell you, when I came to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, that was 19 years ago, I never heard of Unitarian Universalism before that. Why are we keeping our good news of we know how to have a microcosm of world peace? Why are we keeping that a secret? I think we've got to open our mouths and start talking. Will you join me in the dream of Unitarian Universalism where we follow the principles, the seven principles of our faith, and when we extend it so that we can get to world peace. It's not easy to do. Unitarian Universalism is not easy to live. I have to ask you, do you have in your heart room to extend love and kindness to everyone here? To let go of petty disagreements, arguments over stupid things? Do you have it in your heart to open up to all the people here. And you have it in your heart to open up to everyone that you meet and send out energy for everyone in the world. Love and kindness. Are you able to express dignity and respect for every human being, even for those people that don't deserve it? And here's where the question gets harder. What about Donald Trump? He's going to be president on Friday. And I know that some of you are happy about that. And I know that some of you are not happy about that in so much despair and so much distress that there aren't even words to express that. I want to say if you are happy about it, May you celebrate it openly, and may you feel love and support in this congregation. And if you're not happy about it, and you're in despair, I want you to remember Martin Luther King's lesson for us, nonviolent resistance. Nonviolent resistance. And carry on. Live your principles. Affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. Affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in all human relations. Affirm and promote acceptance of one another and encouragement in our spiritual growth. Affirm and promote a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Affirm and promote the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at whole. Affirm and promote the goal of a world community where there is peace and liberty and justice for all. And finally, affirm and promote Respect for the interdependent web for all existence of which we are just one part. Because I assure you, if you live the principles of Unitarian Universalism, you make them your own. You really own those principles and you live your life that way. You will be contributing to getting rid of the crazy in the world.
If you live those principles, you will be contributing to the dream of eradicating prejudice on all levels. So, what better way to honor Martin Luther King Jr.? What better way? Be part of the solution by living your faith and living the principles. Blessed be and amen, and may it be so.